Good afternoon. Today, um, today we're going to talk about the Western migration of slavery. Um, this lecture is kind of out of sequence. Uh, so far, we have been lecturing on the history of uh, migration in the United States, but we haven't really got to the United States yet. So we've been back in the early modern period. We're jumping ahead today, for the most part, to talk about material that you'll need uh, to, or background material for the lab that you are starting now to do. Okay, how many of you have downloaded the data and actually looked at it? Great. I applaud you, both of you. Uh, you do want to get started doing that. Uh, next week, next Friday, we'll talk more about uh, about the lab. Um, I will give you more specific instructions on how to calculate the numbers of migrants. But it will be a lot of good this week if you get familiar with what the, what the numbers look like, what's actually there. Okay? So I thank you in advance for doing that. Uh, this lecture, in addition to the westward migration of slavery, is going to cover a little bit about um, the history of slavery. So in some sense, I can't really, we're going back in time, even before the uh, early modern period, but just briefly. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is the darkness okay? Um, so we will talk a little bit about, um, can we do, can we better than that? Can we do a little bit like that? Can we experiment with that? Put light on the right side. Take this, looks like an experiment. Let's see if these students do better. Uh, sorry, let's write that one. Uh, so I, I will talk a little about the, the, the long history of slavery as well. Um, we'll also talk about the evolution of attitudes towards slavery. We'll talk about Bogle and finally we'll get to this issue of the westward migration of slavery, which is really the motivation for the lab. Okay? So I have an outline. Right. As I just said, we'll first start with the brief, long history of slavery. That sounds like an oxymoron, perhaps it is. Slavery has a very long history. We'll be treating it very briefly. Uh, we'll talk about some of the complexities of slavery, not all of them. Um, then we'll talk about the 18th century view of slavery. That is the view of slavery around the time of the founding of, of the Republic. And then slavery's uh, rapid growth and its demographic and geographic consequences. So um, it's a rather spread out kind of lecture. It doesn't have uh, a very distinct main point that some other lectures have, but all of it I think will be very uh, useful in doing a lab. Uh, I want to start with this, uh, this quote from no less than Aristotle, uh, because it outlines a lot of the, an the, the view of, of slavery from antiquity. And this has a uh, surprisingly significant effect uh, way down, uh, at least in the 19th century. Um, so let me read it quickly. Tame animals are naturally better than wild animals. Yet for all tame animals, there's an advantage in being under human control, as this secures their survival. By analogy, the same must necessarily apply to mankind as a whole. Therefore, all men differ from one another by as much as the soul differs from the body, or man from wild beast. And that is to say to those who work by using their bodies, and to whom that is the best they can do. These people are slaves by nature, and it is better for them to be subject to this kind of control as it is better for other creatures that I mentioned above. Assistance regarding the necessity of life is provided by both groups, by slaves and by domestic animals. Nature must therefore have intended to make the bodies of free men and slaves different also. Slaves' bodies strong for the service they have to do, those of free men upright, and not much use to that kind of work, but instead useful for, sorry, Aristotle, for community life. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of things in here that I, that, that I think are, are quite interesting and quite, um, and I think in, in a way surprising. Athens, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, there's the association of slaves and beasts. Um, that's something that's pretty constant throughout the history of attitudes um, towards slavery. In fact, the Greek word for, for slave, the original Greek word for slave was andropodon, which means man-footed creature. Um, the idea that some men were naturally slaves is in here, right? Nature must therefore have intended to make the bodies of free men different. So there's this, this idea that, that nature, slaves are, slavery is a natural thing, and that nature must have actually made slaves look different. Right? Now, in point of effect, Athens and the Greeks in general did not have a racial concept of slavery as developed in the United States. They're very equal opportunity. Um, the only way you could tell, uh, you could tell slaves from looking at them because they were branded or, um, or were forced to wear certain clothing, um, like chains, for example. Um, but it wasn't a, a racial characteristic. Slavery was inherited. The children of slaves were, were, were slaves for the most part. But the, uh, the, the use of African slaves is, is later on. Nonetheless, those who look back to Aristotle could find the argument all, all the way, all the way that, that far back. Even in Athens, the uh, birthplace of democracy, slavery was quite widespread. A third to half, estimates run as high as a third to half the population of Athens um, have been slaves. Rome was even uh, even more slave dependent. Uh, even earlier than um, than antiquity, we see evidence of the acceptance of slavery, um, perhaps by, by its absence. But it is striking that the Bible has no condemnation of slavery at all. The closest you can find is uh, in Leviticus in the Old Testament. There is an admonition for Israelites not to enslave other Israelites, but rather to enslave other people who are not Israelites. Right? So slavery is, is simply accepted. Christ never says a bad word about slaves, uh, a bad word about slavery per se. It's um, simply part um, part of the world. The origins of slavery may have been in the agricultural revolution. Uh, we call the second bump of human history that we talked about in the first lecture. The, uh, the demands for labor are suddenly much higher. Remember those cheesy pictures I had of the hunters and gatherers lying down in the sun and the poor guy in the agricultural revolution digging in the, in the trenches? Uh, it was harder to be an agriculturalist, right? So the beginnings of, of the agricultural revolution might have, might have um, caused humans to discover slavery. Uh, at the same time, they were domesticating animals, right? It's also possible that slavery uh, began as a, an outgrowth of war. The natural, uh, it, might, it might be obvious that um, prisoners of war would have made great slaves. And in fact, they were traded in, in antiquity, at least. Um, merchants would follow the armies to battle and buy the uh, prisoners of war and then trade them all over the Mediterranean. Interestingly, the, the Tukinamba in Brazil, which is a hunter-gatherer tribe um, in Brazil, this was, uh, you know, were, who were encountered shortly after, after the 1500s, so would have been before they had, they were influenced by Europeans. They had slavery, and interestingly, in that case, they had no economic need for it. Uh, as hunter-gatherers, hunter they did not require slaves for agricultural use, so they used them for, um, for humiliation and for eventual ritual murder and cannibalism. So, so slaves had lots of uses throughout, throughout antiquity. Um, perhaps most surprising factoid about the pervasiveness of slavery comes from the early modern period. Actually, there are two. First, that in 1500, you mentioned that Portuguese, remember, pioneered the idea of, uh, of slave-driven uh, plantation colonies. Madeira, for example, they were already growing slaves in the early, mid-1400s. Um, by 1500, Lisbon's port population was 10% African slaves already, by 1500. Uh, but I think most surprisingly, uh, from the European standpoint at least, was that between 1500 and 1650, estimates run between one and one, 
estimates of the number of Europeans enslaved by North African corsairs run as high as a million, even a million and a half. Right, so in that 150 year period, uh, there may have been a million or more Europeans enslaved by North Africans. This is a, a little bit surprising, but um, but remember when we talked about the decline of Spain, uh, how busy Spain was fighting the Ottomans in the Mediterranean. It was not the Mediterranean was not under the control of Europeans at that uh, for the most part at that time. Um, coastal areas were very much uh, subject to attack by uh, by North African pirates or corsairs who would uh, enslave anybody they found. Uh, there are even reports of going as far north as Iceland to uh, to take to take slaves. So slavery was not in any way a um, a stranger to Europeans uh, in the early modern period or, or going forward from it. Uh, by 1700, when the, or 1709, when the English defeat the, the French in the battle in the War of the Spanish Succession, one of the key uh, provisions in the in the peace treaty is that the British will have the right of asiento, which is the right to sell slaves in the New World, uh, particularly to, to Spanish possessions. Uh, thereafter, after 1709 or so, um, slavery really takes off, and the, so the African slave the African slave trade takes off. There's really quite a, there's quite a lot more uh, slave traffic from Africa to the New World in the 700 than there was in the 1600s. Okay, so the question is about the long that's the long brief history or the brief long history of, of slavery. Any questions about that? Okay, then let's move on to the complexity. And I have another quote here. This is from Mary Mary Chestnut, who is the wife of a congressman from South Carolina. Okay, I'll read this one too. God forgive us, but ours is a monstrous system, a wrong and iniquity, like the patriarchs of old. Our men live all in one house with their wives and their concubines, and the mulattoes one sees in every family partly resemble the white children. Any lady is ready to tell you who is the father of all the mulatto children in everybody's household but her own. Those, she seems to think, drop from the clouds. This highlights certainly one of the complexities of slavery, namely, who, what happens to the children of the slaves and non-slaves? Not, it's not obvious that slavery is hereditary. Um, what happens in uh, the solution in the, in the U.S. South is um, that the children of enslaved women are, are slaves, not necessarily of enslaved men, right? It's, it follows the internal line, in other words. Uh, children born of free women are free. Children born of enslaved women are slaves, regardless of paternity. Um, that's a solution, but it's obviously a complicated solution to a complex problem. There are other additional complexities that have come up and will come up, in addition to offspring slaves and masters, as, as we've seen. What about Christianity? Uh, should, should Christians be in? Should Christians enslave Christians? Again, I refer to the Bible. The, the Old Testament, it was clear that Jews should not enslave Jews, but should Christians enslave Christians? Not always clear. Crimes committed by property are another, another right. Property here in quotes because, of course, property is, uh, is uh, slaves are, are the property in question. Um, in 1855 in Missouri, uh, an enslaved woman named Celia murdered, well, she murdered, kills her owner, uh, Robert Newsom, as he tried to rape her, not for the first time. In Missouri at that time, there were legal protections for slaves who acted in self-defense. Right? They were a little ambiguous, though, about what that meant if they were defending themselves against their owner. Celia had a trial, therefore. And then it became clear that it didn't, didn't count for defending yourself against, against master surprise. Celia was eventually executed. But the fact that she had a trial is kind of interesting because she's property. And as property, she had no rights. But as soon as she committed what was then seen as a crime, she suddenly had a right to a trial. That's odd, don't you think? Um, then there's fugitive slaves and actions of, of abuse. All of it comes down to the same thing, which is that try, as slave owners might, to equate slaves with animals. Slaves are people. And the human dignity and human qualities simply can't be denied. They simply have um, certain abilities and certain understandings, and inevitably, there are going to be these kinds of, of complexities. To this, I add another one, um, which is is uh, political and military. Virtually every slave society at some point, uh, at some crisis, winds up arming their slaves in defense. Even this, even the American South at the end of the Civil War did that. Um, and that's a another odd, let's say, complexity of slavery. Okay, um, I'd like to turn for a moment now in a sort of sideways way to one of the questions that Fogel and Engerman raise in, in Chapter Two, um, but I don't want to do it exactly the way they do. Instead, I want, I want us to address this question. Okay. And so, what I'd like to do is let's take a few minutes. Um, and want to form small groups, three or four people who are convenient, make some new friends, and, and try to answer, try to come up with a, a consensus, try to reach consensus on this, on this question. Could slavery work today? That is, if slaves existed and if slavery were legal, right? Could capitalists using slave labor compete with capitalists using free labor in today's economy? Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm talking about the U.S. world. I mean, a developed economy. Could it work? Um, all right. So take, take a few minutes. Talk amongst yourselves.
Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's come let's come together. Let me start start uh, with a, with a quick poll. Uh, I assume that all of your groups came to a consensus, and everybody when you discuss this with now agree 100%. Uh, but you can vote as individuals, all right? Uh, there are basically two two points of view, yes or no, right? So let's see. First show hands of people who came to the conclusion after five minutes of deep consideration that slavery would could be made to work, right? All right? And those who think it really couldn't. Great, we're about evenly divided. That's perfect. <laughs> um, those who think it could work, who who will volunteer with a pithy statement that sums up why it should work, why it would work? Yes. I think it would be efficient if capitalists using slave labor could compete with capitalists using slave. Like, the question is, does that mean, does that mean it, would it work or would it be efficient? And what I mean is it would be efficient that slavery could actually compete with free labor. Okay. So do you have are there more questions or is there a pithy statement? I'm looking for a pithy statement. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, this would be a um, statement is that, that capitalists are always trying to reduce costs and what could reduce costs more than driving labor costs to zero? Okay. How, about a, how about a pithy statement the other way? Uh, yes, in the back. Okay, so this point, point of view, and this is, this is an excellent statement, I'm going to try to, try to summarize it, because this has echoes in very much in the 19th century. The statement is that um, better than slave labor is very, very cheap labor. It's a system where you pay workers just enough so that they can subsist and perhaps reproduce, um, and nothing more. And that's going to be cheaper than, than, than slave labor, because you don't have, to, um, you don't have a, whole, a whole number of costs that are incumbent on, on a slave driver, security, supervision, and, and so on. I think it's actually encapsulated pretty nicely, the, the main views. Does anyone, does anyone dying to add something to that? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, question is, well, can, let's let's define exactly what we mean by slavery, and, and you can call this call low wages, subsistence level wages, economic slavery. Well, but what I mean is really slavery, and, and I do want to draw uh, a line there. That's that's important. Um, even under economic slavery, slaves, so-called slaves, wage slaves, as it were, have the rights to to marry. They have the rights to own property. In some places, they have the right to vote. It's still different. They're not cut off from their past and from their from their future. They're not owned, and nobody would trade places. I think. Um, yes. <laughs> Isn't the American dream to own everything you use? Uh, owning all your labor is so, so owning slaves as part of the American dream. <laughs> okay, we better stop with this. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what, I, what I was expecting to get to isn't exactly where we got to. We sort of jumped, jumped ahead. I think what developed here was kind of the debate, um, it mirrored more the debate between slaveholders and, and um, anti slavery in, in more the 19th century. But I want to talk a little about the 18th century view, which is where I actually thought we would, uh, we would wind up. Um, the uh, 18th century view is that slavery was, was doomed, that slavery really could not exist, even in a, um, even in a, in a in a society, in an economy as sophisticated as, as, um, as the United States, the American economy, around the time of the revolution. And here are the, basically the reasons. Uh, they grow out of more of an enlightenment thinking, uh, which really, we, we mentioned, I mentioned enlightenment before, and we're, we're going to touch on it a little bit more. But I want to take another couple of minutes to digress on it. Uh, the enlightenment is, a, refers both to a period and an intellectual movement that takes place again in the 18th century for the most part, where people start to apply the scientific revolution of the 1600s, that is of Newton and so forth, to society. In other words, people take a scientific, rational approach to figuring out how government should work and how how people, uh, people behave. The most important figure for our purposes of the Enlightenment is John Locke, who wrote in the 1680s. And he writes that, somewhat, in some sense, he's, re he's replying to Thomas Hobbes, who was the first to write about the state of nature. Hobbes is the one who, who wrote that uh, life in the state of nature was um, see, mean, brutish, and short. Remember? Uh, and Hobbes' conclusion was that, from the state of nature, humans naturally had to, had to choose a ruler, a strong ruler, and subvert their own, their own rights to that 